New York City has a problem. Just five years ago, NYPD responded to an average of 10 calls per month for drag racing across the city's five boroughs. Today, that average has skyrocketed to 10 calls per day. This multifaceted issue has only grown worse over the years, partly fueled by the easy access to affordable but fast vehicles, the systematic dismantling of drag racing tracks across America thanks to the effects of urban sprawl and the worst one of all, the insatiable appetite for Instagram clout. The risk for participating in a street race in New York is a Class A misdemeanor, punishable with a fine between $300 to $525, but the reward of likes, followers, and a buzzing Instagram username handle seems to be a fair exchange to young, impressionable minds across the city. The NYPD's multi-billion dollar annual budget and 36,000 full-time officers are in an ongoing struggle to keep the city's street racing epidemic under control, but with suspect cars that drastically overpower patrol vehicles and crumbling infrastructure make it almost impossible to solve. But how did it get to this point? Well, it's pretty complicated. Welcome to Explain. In the height of the 60s muscle car era, street racing was a frowned upon and unspoken reality for the NHRA. They wanted safe, controlled environments for racing with lucrative ticket sales at racetracks, while some racers wanted to test their production-based pro-stock cars on the street for bragging rights, big crowds, and huge tax-free winnings. Across the U.S. in the late 60s, there were numerous hotspots of illegal street racing, from the stretch of road between Detroit and Pontiac, Michigan, named Woodward Avenue, where an unbeatable Hemi-powered Plymouth GTX, nicknamed the Silver Bullet, was king, all the way to the birthplace of hot riding itself, Southern California, where racers would cruise Van Nuys Boulevard and search for quarter-mile races from stoplight to stoplight. In New York City, however, racing was more discreet and more dangerous. The connecting highway, which like it sounds, connected the Brooklyn Queens Expressway to the Grand Central Parkway in Queens was the home of big money races in the city. Everything from pro stock Hemis to even a dragster raced from underpass to underpass, with as many as 40 cars and 3,000 spectators occupying the lanes on any given night. As the police presence became overwhelming, even to the point of 26 arrests in a single day, the illegal races would scatter across the city, and the legend of the connecting highway would be relegated to Polaroid photos and magazine stories and retrospectives. In the 90s, spots like Hunts Point in the South Bronx and Fountain Avenue in Brooklyn became a hotbed for racing, and unlike decades prior, with General Motors, Fomoko, and Chrysler's finest engines roaring down the blacktop, Japanese cars became a common contender amongst the domestic competition. Honda's little but mighty B-Series powered Civic and CRXs quickly gained an elite reputation amongst the underground leagues, as they were lightweight with a relatively simple dual overhead cam inline four-cylinder that responded strongly to turbocharging. The task of owning a personal car in New York City was already a hassle, so the compact body style, great turning radius, and great fuel mileage made the Honda platform ideal for a weekend racer and weekday commuter all in one. The reputation of these Hondas would then become immortalized when an article written by Ken Lee called Racer X was published in the May 1998 issue of Vibe magazine, which tells the story of a street racer named Rafael Estevez and his quest for a 10-second quarter-mile capable Honda. The Racer X article would reach all the way to Hollywood, inspiring director Rob Cohen to pitch the idea of a street racing movie to Universal Pictures, which birthed the Fast and Furious movie and street racing emerged out of the shadows into the mainstream. 
There was an explosion of tuning shops all over the city catering to imports from Honda, Nissan, Mitsubishi, and Subaru, and even German offerings from BMW like the M3 and AMGs from Mercedes, all with the goal of squeezing out every ounce of power that the manufacturer leaves on the table. And as the years progressed, ECU processors got more powerful, turbocharger design and implementation got better, and ultimately the cars got much faster and more dangerous. An even more concerning issue was starting to rear its head, which was the systematic shutdown of racetracks around the city due to suburban sprawl. The process typically happened like this. A drag strip built in the 50s and 60s on acres of agricultural zoned area becomes encroached upon by developments of residential homes and commercial shopping centers as the population grows on the outskirts of the city. As homes are built near racetracks, complaints of noise begin to happen, limiting the time the track can operate, and with the land the drag strip is built on being much more valuable, and the city wanting property tax revenue from residential homes and shopping malls rather than a drag strip, the owner of the drag strip sells the property versus continuing a losing battle against residents and urban planning committees. On Long Island, with a population over 8 million residents, racetracks were subsequently shut down, like West Hampton, Freeport, and Islip, with the same story, sold to corporations since the property taxes based on the increased land value was more than what the racetrack could bring in with ticket sales. If you wanted to race legally, you'd have to take the hour's drive with tolls to New Jersey's Atco Dragway, which some did, but a lot of racers just took it to the streets and the street racing problem grew tremendously across all five boroughs. One glaring factor to the rise of New York's unstoppable street racing scene, and even the country as a whole, was the ease of access to fast cars. In the 1960s, a 10-second quarter-mile streetcar took an assortment of parts to be quick, from a fully built and blueprinted engine, a built transmission with a higher stall converter, higher rear gear ratio, traction aids, and even nitrous. In today's world, an unassuming BMW 340i X-Drive with the venerable B58 Turbo inline 6 engine is just an ECU tune, a downpipe, and E85 fuel away from matching those figures while also being very unsuspecting to the naked eye. 60, 100. The BMW 340i was essentially half the price of the flagship BMW M3, but with bolt-on modifications, it was faster for much cheaper. Where a Chevelle or Fox Body Mustang would need a skilled professional to re-engineer the car to reach those breakneck speeds in 1,320 feet, the BMW or even an Infiniti Q50 was just some hand tools and an internet connection away from being a real performer and younger enthusiasts quickly flocked to those platforms. One, two, three. Social media played an immense role in bringing awareness to certain cars as sleepers, or cars that go under the radar from cops as they blend in well with traffic but possess the performance of much more ostentatious supercars. A young Jamaican teen going by the Instagram username OneStockF30 was integral in showing the potential of these understated BMWs. Racing built Nissan GTRs, Camaro Z01s, and Trackhawks, vehicles worth double and triple the price and winning. At one point, the whole city was tuned into an unfolding David vs. Goliath story, a measly BMW 340i taking down exotics and muscle cars on the street for bets as large as 
The reputation of German coupes and sedans had always been a staple amongst New Yorkers, dating back to the 80s with the E30 M3, the 500E Mercedes, the SL, and many more. But what the 240, 340, and 440i had that those didn't was that they were attainable and blended in with traffic, making it the perfect candidate for a getaway car. NYPD's pursuit policy requires that a vehicle pursuit be terminated whenever the risk to officers and the public outweigh the danger to the community if the suspect is not immediately apprehended. Pursuits in a city as densely populated as New York are extremely dangerous to civilians and pedestrian onlookers, leading NYPD to almost always call off chases for nonviolent crimes like street racing and speeding. Officers would rather use the offender's license plate to reveal the identity of the individual and arrest later in a much safer environment. This doctrine made the trend of using ghost cars or vehicles with altered or stolen plates that don't match the offender's identity so they can elude police with impunity to become the norm amongst criminals and even street racers. A crackdown announced today on what Mayor Adams calls ghost cars. Those are vehicles that have fake license plates on them. In response, NYPD in the beginning of 2023 began to chase indiscriminately with a 600% jump in pursuits from the prior year thanks to the most active of units called the community response teams, which are plain clothes officers in polo shirts and khakis who drive unmarked cars, which are mostly blacked out Ford Tauruses. This explosion in pursuits does have a downside. Innocent civilians who are caught between the struggle of man and machine, and in some cases have to pay the ultimate price. The NYPD is stuck between a rock and a hard place when it comes to solving the street racing issue, being more tough on evaders and chasing them, pitting innocent civilians at risk, or call off the chase, which reinforces criminals to running away and burdens the system with higher insurance premiums thanks to hit and runners. In essence, New York's street racing problem just boils down to three factors. Every year, there are less and less drag ships which house a safe and controlled environment for racing to happen thanks to the effects of urban development. Having access to a 500 horsepower or more car is as easy as signing on the dotted line for a high interest rate loan on a used BMW and adding a downpipe and a tune. And last of all, social media encourages copycats to emulate what they see for likes and follows, but most lack the skill set required to properly control and handle a performance vehicle, leading to more preventable accidents that burden the system as a whole. I say all this to say, if you see a Where's 981 or Sean Sean video, don't replicate it because you don't got it and you'll probably Mac.